Ellen Lambert, who is just um, inspiring in her own right, is coming up and she's going to lead the panel. She's the executive vice president of the Merck uh, Company Foundation. And so it's a pleasure to have Ellen up here. And she and her guests are going to talk about innovation and healthcare and partnerships and really how to build social impact. So with that, welcome to the stage. Okay, we're gonna hope that we're lucky. Can you hear me? It's incredible to be postponed for a presentation like that. So I wanna thank you for doing that. I think we all learned a lot. Um, for those of you who were here this morning, I have polled this panel, and every single one of the people up here is a hungry, overly social, impatient to change the world in healthcare baby boomer. <laughs> So I want to say welcome them and their ideas and innovation. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what they do and then pose them some pointed and some not so pointed questions so we can talk to you about um, best practices, examples of partnerships, typical and atypical, places where partnership in healthcare has succeeded or looks to be successful, and places where those partnerships may not have worked. And I'm gonna to start to my immediate left with Dr. Baxter, Ray. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my head is still back in that last presentation. That was really extraordinary uh, and exciting um, set of uh, events that was described there. Um, I'm uh, with Kaiser Permanente, which is uh, a large nonprofit healthcare system that takes care of about 9 million people in the United States. Um, we um, take an approach to that which is not limited to the delivery of healthcare, but that we call total health, uh, based on the common sense principle that uh, if you're healthy, we probably see you for about 15 or 20 minutes a year. Uh, and have a lot of contact with you in between by email and through other kinds of means. And if you're ill or disabled, we may see you for a week or two in the course of the year. But your health uh, and your life is shaped outside of our walls. So if we want you to be healthy, uh, we have to be intimately involved in the environments that are really shaping your health. We call that approach total health. And what I'll talk about a bit later are how we've approached that in partnership, because clearly that is well beyond our means to do alone. Um, I'll talk about some work that we have done, beginning with small local partnerships between our nonprofit health system and a public health department and community-based organizations that has now scaled up um, to literally hundreds of communities that now have active groups working around healthy eating and active living and which has scaled to some national partnerships, one of which you heard about yesterday um, is uh, the campaign we are privileged to partner in with uh, HBO and the Institute of Medicine, the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control, and the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, uh, which culminated in a four-part documentary series that launched a couple of weeks ago uh, and is now spreading through the country in a whole variety of different media. Um, all of that work um, has to be done in partnership. That's been the key to what we've been able to accomplish, and we think it's the key to, way, to the ways in which healthcare will have to be changed. Thank you. Dr. O'Neill. Uh, hi, I'm Mara O'Neill, and I am the Chief Innovation Officer and Senior Counselor to the Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development, and uh, that is the development arm of the foreign policy of the U.S. government. We operate in 79 countries, and uh, our goal is exactly what you said, uh, Ellen, earlier. We just say we want a safer, healthier, more prosperous world, and that's what we live and breathe every day. Um, we are particularly interested in game-changing innovations that can um, really put us on a different trajectory to getting these outcomes sooner, faster, cheaper. Um, we love partnerships. We've done a 1,000 of them over the last decade, 3,000 different partners, um, leveraged $8.8 .8 billion of, uh, against our budget. Um, and so we believe that uh, that's actually how this works, is an ecosystem of assets that the private sector brings, not-for-profit, as well as the public sector. So I'm delighted to be on this panel and um, look forward to the conversation. 
Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Richardson. I'm the Vice President of the Abbott Fund. Uh, the fund is the philanthropic arm of Abbott Laboratories. Uh, I oversee all the international giving programs, and that will be the focus of uh, my comments uh, later this afternoon. Uh, we are focused primarily on HIV AIDS, uh, maternal child health, nutrition, neglected diseases, and now sticking our toe in the NCD waters with some diabetes programs. Uh, like my uh, previous uh, panel members have already stated, uh, we too rely heavily on partnerships to uh, succeed in anything that we do, and I'm eager to talk more about that as we get into the panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm going to pose this question first to you, Jeff. Um, Craig Venter talked about private industry as operating three times faster than the public or government sector. Do you think that partnerships with private industry can drive faster health care results and better health care results? And how do we go about sharing that private industry speed in the public sector? And please, I, I would like comments from the other panels, but Jeff, take a stab first. We started our international uh, giving programs in 2000, and uh, initially we were focused solely on HIV AIDS, and in the last two years we've expanded our portfolio. And I think the answer is, um, at least on the, from the foundation side, uh, it depends. Uh, we've had some great experiences with a, a number of partners. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, know the Baylor College of Medicine Pediatric AIDS Initiative or the AMPATH program or the Indiana University Kenya program in Western Kenya, partnering with Moy Hospital, uh, Partners in Health. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with them and a number of other really outstanding partners. We also have an operation uh, in uh, Tanzania where we have a 15-person office where we've invested more than $90 million over the last 10 years to modernize their healthcare systems. So in the context of your question, I think we have helped uh, the Baylor program uh, really take off in a way that they might not have without the help of not only the, the Abbott Fund, but also the Bristol-Myers Squibb Foundation. We made some uh, major investments on the front end, and those investments uh, started out with a fairly uh, minor contribution for their Romania program, where they opened their first pediatric AIDS clinic in 2001, serving some 700 patients. Now, 10 plus years later, they're serving over 100,000 uh, children and young people living with HIV and AIDS. And those investments that Br Bristol Mars Squibb and Abbott made at the front end now are being matched uh, by CDC, uh, by NIH, and actually by USAID. Uh, one of the, the two new clinics that they just opened in Tanzania, for example, one in Mbeya that Abbott funded and the other in Mwanza that BMS funded, uh, those we, we put the money on the table to build the facilities, but USAID has put up $22.5 million to, to run those operations. And I think what incented USAID, and they mentioned many, many partnerships that they're doing, but I think this was a great incentive for them to, to join in on this, and it was an incentive for, for us uh, also to build that facility. One other quick example, and I'd like to talk more about Tanzania uh, later because it's a larger uh, issue, but uh, a larger, I should say, enterprise. But right now we're working with uh, Partners in Health in, in Haiti. And this program is to build a new nutrition plant uh, that will make Nuri Mamba or a peanut butter paste for malnourished children. But what we're doing in addition to that, uh, we're building the plant in such a way that they will be able to make peanut butter that they will be able to sell. And the profits from that, the sale of the peanut butter will actually fund uh, the Nuri Mamba uh, enterprise. And so it's a really an intersection of philanthropy, the $4 million we're putting on the table to, to build the plant, uh, but also uh, then with the sales, and we hope this will work. This is the first time we've done this, so this is a new uh, thing for us. But this intersection between philanthropy and social enterprise, uh, we think is uh, something that will actually enable uh, Partners in Health not only to sustain that program in Haiti, but we think it might be a model for other programs throughout the world that we're not only supporting, but other philanthropists are as well. So Mara, you are really well known for projects where you use financial resources to source and scale up programs. Right. Can you talk about some of those partnerships? and? Were they all successful? I mean, a thousand partnerships is a huge number. Right. 
And right. Well, um, I will say something that you rarely hear from the U.S. Go from a government official that failure is a necessary part of discovery. And so, when people um, hold our partnerships or our um, development efforts up, I say, you know, in drug discovery, we never expected every single experiment to work. And so, part of it is um, to fail fast and to have corrections to the course. And I think we're trying to get better um, at that. So, yes, I think that um, we have. I've certainly had projects that we've learned a lot from um, because I think there's a lot of unexpected things that uh, happen uh, out there. But I think that what we have done in the last couple years in this administration that we're particularly excited about is we are enormously proud of the deep, long relationships we've had with large healthcare companies. But we have a fundamental belief that great ideas and innovation comes from all different places and all different people, and we can't predict where that is. And so we want to set up mechanisms to source that. So we knew that one of the Millennium Goals that we were just doing terrible on uh, as a world was reducing maternal mortality and child mortality. And so we launched a challenge a year ago called Saving Lives at Birth, and uh, we had a proposal we had a call for ideas about how you could actually save mom's lives and save um, children at the time of birth. We had 700 um, ideas or proposals from countries all over the world. We chose 24 of them. And so we have been very excited about new mechanisms that make it easier for startups or smaller companies or people who don't necessarily uh, have PhDs in advocating the US government to be able to be in magnet for these new ideas, either in a not-for-profit, a social uh, venture, or in a for-profit, um, because we believe that either of those, or both of those are part of the solution. Thank you. So Ray, your expertise and, and real passion has been for public health, and with Kaiser Permanente, you've now entered into one of the largest, most complex three-sector partnerships. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that, what you hope to see the results, not only in terms of the outreach, um, but also on the ground for people? Um, I, I will, and, and I guess the, the, the three parts that you're referring to are the, the health organizations of the government um, and HBO and the philanthropic world uh, working with us uh, all together around the, the crisis uh, of obesity and the chronic disease that, uh, that flows from it. Um, a lot of people have focused on the extraordinary rollout uh, of the films themselves um, and the uh, amount of reach that we're experiencing from those already uh, is, is quite gratifying. Uh, but it's important to understand the films are the trigger for a set of discussions among communities, within organizations, and so forth, that we want to lead to action. Um, they are really designed to catch that attention, to share information, to spark uh, debate and discussion, and then action. So um, we have, along with this, a set of community action kits. 40,000 of those have been produced or in the process of being distributed now. Uh, dropped by air, uh, almost, uh, in a sense. People going to hbo.com or going to kp.org and, and, uh, and registering to get one of these and offering to lead a community discussion around this set of issues. They contain guides to the films, but they also contain step-by-step -step kind of uh, community action in a box. Uh, kits, guides for people about what kinds of issues to raise, how to probe for people's views and so forth, how to activate people, and how to get people um, in touch with organizations that are already taking action so that people don't have to start from scratch. They don't have to say, how do we do this? Where do we start? Uh, there's uh, a, a platform now called Community Commons that some of you may be familiar with. Um, that creates access to over 3,000 organizations around the United States that are working in communities to change the conditions that lead to unhealthy eating and lack of routine physical activity. So you multiply these activities out and out and out by putting people in touch with each other in ways that they haven't been by providing the beginnings of discussions and a set of beginning tools, and then they take off on their own. Thank you. I think most of you in the audience are familiar with partnerships where you create a partnership in the private sector and the public sector with an NGO. 
Um, more recently, we are involving governments, finance, and health ministers to really drive better quality health care in a faster way. But I'd like each of the panelists to think of an example where something completely different has happened than you expected. And Jeff, I'm going to go back to you so you can talk a little bit about how you began in Tanzania and what you're seeing now, because again, that was a very complex undertaking. You know, when we started out, it was really the, uh, along with the Baylor program in Romania, it was the first time we had done any kind of work at all. We had no blueprint or no roadmap. We had a lot of people that we talked to and discussed about what might work or might not work. So we started out with an AIDS, Orphans, and Vulnerable Children program uh, in Tanzania. And the government asked us to start in Mbeya, which is about 13 hours away from Dar es Salaam and really in a fairly remote part of the country. And we actually, and just to hark back what you said, we really built our house as we lived in it. And we're still doing that. We still feel that we're learning every day. But we had such a positive reaction from the government of Tanzania at every step along the way as we slowly expanded the program that to date now we've invested more than $90 million of the $250 million that we've invested in our global AIDS care program uh, to, to work with them to now modernize their health care systems. And what happened just briefly, our CEO went to visit and as he was visiting Muhimbili Hospital in Dar es Salaam, uh, he asked one of the Ministry of Health officials, how can we help? And, um, and they said, well, we need to upgrade this hospital. So not only did we help upgrade the hospital, we built a new outpatient center, completely gutted the central pathology lab and rebuilt that. And more recently, we've modernized all 23 hospital labs in the country. But to your question, and what's different about this, is we've decided not just to write the checks, but we now have people on the ground uh, from Abbott Park in Illinois and Abbott Ireland who are working side by side with the lab technicians in all of the labs, not only to teach them how to use the equipment, which incidentally we maintain. We have two uh, field service engineers that maintains our donated equipment, which uh, is quite uh, remarkable if you traveled a lot overseas to see uh, the disrepair a lot of the donated equipment is in. But not only are we teaching them how to use the equipment, but also how to manage the labs. And the goal is to actually make these labs profit centers so that they'll pay for themselves. And in some situations, like the CPL, the Central Pathology Lab in Dar es Salaam, actually help uh, meet the, uh, some of the expenses of the overall hospital. So the whole transition now has moved into that area. And I hark back to the Haiti Project as well, working not only with our engineers and our Abbott scientists, our nutritionists, our global purchasing, purchasing people and marketing people too, again, that's, that's looking at this, again, intersection between social enterprise and philanthropy. So we're, we're looking at a new way of doing this, but it all started out with a fairly modest program targeted to AIDS, orphans, and vulnerable children. Um, so I think one of the unexpected things, or one of the things that um, we believe is a shift that we're making, is to um, think about the exit strategy, the end game, uh, at the very beginning rather than the end. How is this going to be sustainable over the long term by the host country or by, uh, in, in our uh, world, in the developing world, or by the private sector? So I'll give you an example of something we're excited about. So through our Development Innovation Ventures Fund, which is this thing where we source and scale, um, we uh, realized that one of the big problems in the developing world in healthcare is healthcare workers actually don't show up to work. And it's a big problem. You can't really... Uh, 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 getting decent health care if, uh, like in India, 40% of them don't show up every day. And, uh, and they still get paid. So uh, it's a problem. And so um, some smart researchers in the U.S. developed a biometrics uh, system where in Karnataka, which is, for those of you who are tech people know that that's the place where Bangalore is, but that state is 52 million people in India. Um, they uh, put a biometric system in there and created incentives for those healthcare workers to show up. It's been dramatically uh, improved healthcare attendance. And um, the government said if we funded the evaluation to see if this would scale, that they would take it over and make it best practices. So I think part of what we need to think about at the beginning, to your point, is think about what do we need to do now to institutionalize these game changers and these best practices, um, and think about that from the beginning. I think one of the early lessons that I learned about partnership um, was contradictory to all the conventional wisdom I'd been given, which is uh, find somebody who's better than you are at something, find somebody with a track record, uh, go with a winner. Um, when we started uh, building partnerships, we had very little money to do it with at first. Um, and 
we um, tied on to a CDC initiative, which was uh, awarding funds around the country. It was called Steps to a Healthier America. Um, and we said, well, let's partner with the public health departments in communities where we are. We'll get, we'll get them some money to help them prepare their applications, organize, and so forth. And then we'll have the nucleus of the kind of working group we wanted to have. Um, so we uh, did that in 10 communities. Um, in only one of those communities uh, did they win a federal award. So somebody on the team said, well, what do we do now? We're only one for 10. We'll never get where we need to go. And somebody else said, well, let's back the losers. We backed the losers. So we figured they had already organized. They already had a community of partners working. They wanted to do something. And so we funded each of the losers in our, in our communities for the next year. They competed in the second round. Five awards were made. Our communities got three of them. And we continued that way. And suddenly we had leveraged $27 million in federal dollars um, to get the work going. So don't always back the winners. Take a hard look at the losers. And sometimes you should back them. So another thing I'd like to talk to you all about, when you create a partnership and you all have the funding to do that, what do you look for in those partnerships? BMS and Abbott, interesting partnership. It should speak to all of us with a lesson. Government is central in so many of the partnerships. What are you looking for in good partners, in strong partners? where to put your funding. I know you're talking about that nexus between entrepreneurship and the NGO sector. But what, are, what other things are you looking for? Think, uh, first of all, somewhat of a track record. I mean, it doesn't have to be a long track record. When we started with Baylor, I mean, they had, we built the first clinic with them in, in Romania. But they had a reputation, obviously, as one of the leading pediatric uh, uh, hospitals in, in the world. Um, certainly with Partners in Health and Ampath and others, um, uh, they, they came with somewhat of a reputation, somewhat of a track record. But we're also supporting some smaller NGOs who are willing to take uh, risks. Uh, I think we're looking for people who have good ideas, who are willing to be innovative, who are willing to take risks. Um, we have a number of partners, uh, incidentally, who not only have great programmatic ideas, but sometimes what they need is help in the operational side. And we actually fund uh, the, like the CFO, the COO, the development director. We actually fund core administrative functions because we don't feel it's fair for NGOs to be told that they, you can only use this money for programs, but you can't have anyone that can report on the programs or anyone to keep the books. And so uh, we're, we're, we're also about building the NGO capacity as well as in the government situation in Tanzania, uh, we help uh, pay for some of the uh, operations at the hospital. And, uh, and we think that's critical because one can't be done without the other. I would just also say, too, that we have also sometimes learned that we're the problem. And, and I would maybe say a number of us in the room have, have done this, uh, where we've been very focused on cranking up the numbers. And this was especially true in the PMTCT area. Get more people tested. Just get more people tested. And the numbers kept going up, up, and up. But what happened was when you asked the question, and then what happened? What happened to those people that were tested? The loss of follow-up numbers were also equally high. And so what we need to do is step back and also figure out what happens to these people that we're caring for at the front end. And so what we've been working with the NGOs and ourselves and taking this sort of introspective look with groups like KPMG, FSG, Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, uh, DAI, and others, we're sort of stepping back and saying, how can we be a better donor as well as getting our grantees to understand what we need. And so what we want now is we want less than 10% loss of follow-up. And we're saying we don't care how many people you test next quarter. We want those numbers to be <coughs> under 10%. And I think that was very welcomed, as you might imagine, by the grantee. And it makes us, I think, a better donor as well. So there's a learning process that goes through a mutual learning process. And I think we're going to get a lot more quality. And, and I mentioned Ampath earlier as, as an example where they're using technology to track down their patients. And they're, they're, they're using handheld GPS and smartphones and emergency, emergency medical record systems. They have a 97% welcoming rate into the homes, have over 95% of the people agreeing to be tested for HIV. That's way off the charts. Most organizations are celebrating when they get to 50%. And their loss of follow-up now is heading towards 10%. And they have 150,000 ACE patients and are building on that platform to do 
uh, cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. And again, building in this, um, <coughs> this uh, tracking of patients to make sure that after the initial test is done or the initial visit, they know what's happening to them six months, a year, or six years out. And that's, that's the goal of this, uh, of this uh, learning. I just had a couple quick things. Um, I think that uh, viol uh, conflict occurs when there's a violation of expectations, so it's really important at the front end to have a conversation of why, why are you going into this partnership, what does success look like, and have those kinds of conversations at the front end to make sure that you're aligned. The second thing, and it builds on what you were saying, um, Jeff, and that is we want people to focus on um, and being comfortable with creating evidence about what's working and what's not, and doing that soon so we can make those corrections to the course. And lastly, we want to be, um, we want to have a partner that's results driven. It isn't about the number of tests you do, it's really about um, did you actually affect the mm. end goal. So we start with what's the outcome that we're looking for, what's the impact we're trying to have, and then back up from that. And if we have a partner that is only interested in um, training a certain people or doing something but doesn't care about the outcome, then we probably, probably is the best partner for us. Yeah, I'd, I'd add two quick things. One is um, we use a principle that we call convergence when we're partnering with someone. And that is what, where we need to be together is around the problem we're trying to solve and the work we're going to do. We don't control the rest of their agenda. They don't try to recruit us into all of their agenda. And we don't worry about that so much. And, and many times, I think, partnerships get delayed or only partially fulfilled because people try to have control over the entire agenda of the partner rather than just focusing on where are we working together. And that is the point where we need to be accomplishing um, things together. Um, the second um, thing is that, that not all wisdom lies on one side of the partnership. Uh, and you have to be willing to go in a different direction um, when, when learning occurs. We've ended up in a lot of communities doing work now around safety in neighborhoods because you can't tell people to be more physically active if they're afraid or if they're afraid for their children to be outside instead of inside sitting on a couch playing a video game. So you either have to be willing to move in a different direction, in that case, public safety for a healthcare organization, um, or you need to get out of the game and let somebody else do that. So we're getting close. I'd like to sum up the conversation with five points and then add a sixth thought. What we've learned from our partners is number one, have clear expectations for your partnership right from the beginning, correct? Gather evidence and be results driven, but do not crank the numbers. Correct? Know what you want to accomplish and get it done. Also, take a chance and back the losers. There are some important lessons in that kind of partnership as well. And follow up. Make sure the outcomes you talked about at the beginning that you're following up so people don't become numbers in healthcare. And last but not least, and this is the challenge I have for you all, how do we take successful partnerships and have them partner with other successful partnerships so that we create a web and can really impact global health for better results much faster. Thank you all. Thank you, panelists. <laughs>